Happy Tuesday, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Lewis. Uh, I'm a member of the LRA Young Leaders Board. I'm an actor, and I'm also someone living with the group for the past 14 years. It's an honor to welcome you all today, today to today's live panel on lupus and cognitive health, presented by Lucas Research Alliance's Young Leaders Board. Now, this panel was supposed to take place in LRA's New York City offices in March, but with the pandemic, we decided to go virtual, giving us the opportunity to bring this extremely relevant topic to a much wider audience. And I'm really proud of the efforts of the Young Leaders Board to get this panel out to as many people as possible. United in an effort to raise lupus awareness, this diverse professional group focuses on fundraising and advocacy efforts for lupus research programs. In case this is your first introduction to the Young Leaders Board, members and volunteers of YLB, like myself, organize programs centered around congressional advocacy, community outreach, disease awareness, fundraising, and social gatherings for folks in the lupus community. In hopes to further the efforts of this group, I am pleased to introduce our distinguished panel of experts tonight. They're here to address some questions and concerns surrounding cognition, mental health, and stability, as well as research that may make a difference in the lives of those struggling with lupus. The goal of today's webcast is to bring relevant and actionable information to those managing their lupus during this particular time of social unrest amid a global pandemic. We hope you leave today's webcast with new knowledge about how these research efforts and action experts are taking uh, are being used to understand the cognitive obstacles people with lupus work through day to day. And some tools, hopefully you'll gain some tools to guide you through your own obstacles. Without further ado, let me introduce our distinguished guests of scientists and counselors. First up, Dr. Megan Mackey <laughs> is a rheumatologist and researcher at the Feinstein Lupus Center of Excellence. Researchers at the Feinstein Lupus Center, like Dr. Mackey, work to transform the treatment of conditions like lupus, arthritis, cancer, psychiatric illness, and all terms. At the global headquarters of bioelectric medicine, they're exploring ways to raise the standard of medical innovation by developing electronic medical devices to signal the body to heal itself. Dr. Mackey has been seeing lupus patients for over 20 years, working to understand how problems in the immune system lead to lupus, how we can develop less toxic therapies for lupus, and how to use brain imaging to figure out how the brain is affected by lupus. Dr. Teo Steva is the Chief Scientific Officer of the Lupus Research Alliance. And in this role, she is responsible for overseeing the organization's research portfolio and operations, including the development of research strategies and implementation, as well as overseeing all research initiatives, partnerships, and collaboration. Very excited to hear from you both. Next, I'd like to introduce Priscilla Torrell. She is the Senior Manager of Charla de Lupus and Lupus Line, programs offered through the Hospital of Special Surgery and programs I hold close to my heart. As I was introduced to Priscilla and her team last year after falling out of remission. Working to reach Latinos, Hispanics, and African-American communities with lupus and their families, their national program offers people with lupus and their families peer health, support, and education in both English and Spanish. They've been doing this since 1994. Priscilla oversees program initiatives, training and supervision of the program, uh, supervision of the program staff and volunteers, initial screening and psychosocial assessment and social work intervention with patients and their families. Another member of this beautiful program is Lillian Mendez. She is the Senior Program Associate for Charlie de Lupus. Lillian's struggle with lupus has inspired her 19-year commitment to this community as she provides peer health education, emotional support to pediatric, adolescent, and adult patients with lupus and their loved ones throughout New York City. She also provides phone support locally and nationally through the Charlie chat line. Along with her colleagues, Lillian also facilitates a monthly teen, young adult, and parent lupus support group through HSS. I'm actually hoping to get back out there soon once all this subsides. So thank you all for joining the panel today. Thank you also to the webcast attendees for submitting questions in advance. For any additional questions, please use the online chat during the session, and we'll do our best to address the questions at the end, time permitting. All right, so with that, let's get started.
Dr. Maggie. As an LRA funded researcher at one of the centers in our National Lupus Clinical Investigators Network, you conduct a clinical trial that tests whether a drug can prevent brain cell damage in people with lupus that leads to problems with concentration and memory. Could you tell us a bit more about this and, and what you've been seeing so far in the trial? Also, as the drugs are being as the drugs being tested are AC inhibitors, already approved by the FDA to treat high blood pressure. How does this help the trial in terms of funding? Okay. Okay, so thank you, Martin. And um, I just want to say a big thanks to the Young Leaders Board for organizing this fantastic venue. Uh, it's really amazing to me, being a techno dinosaur, what the internet can provide for us. And I guess that's one of the good things that COVID taught us. Um, but so, yes, I am um, in charge of a new clinical trial. For lupus, um, I will have to say, however, it has not started enrollment yet. Um, we were a little derailed by COVID um, not being allowed. We can't do clinical research in this current time, although that's rapidly evolving. Um, but um, what I did want to do was talk about the trial, what led to the trial, how we got to this point, because it really is only the second clinical trial that has ever been done in brain research in lupus. And you have to ask, why is that? There are lots of clinical trials ongoing that have been done in the last 15 years in lupus, and um, but not in the brain. And the, the major reason for that is understandably, we have almost no access to brain tissue uh, or to the spinal fluid that surrounds the brain. Both of those would be really informative, but who in their right mind would allow us to biopsy, you know, so of course we don't ask. Um, but we have figured out ways around that. And I'm really lucky. I work with a group at the Feinstein um, and there are basic scientists who work in the lab and they work with um, mouse models of lupus and we learn from them and they learn from me and my colleagues. We work with lupus patients who volunteer to help us and we do brain imaging studies and cognitive testing. So, the, the whole idea is to understand mechanisms. If we understand how the, at a cellular level, what's going wrong with the cells, what's going wrong at a molecular level, then we can design better treatments or any treatments really for brain disease and lupus. Um, and, and it's really just all about mechanisms. Um, the other problem we've had with trying to understand this is that you, for example, somebody could have cognitive problems, meaning problems with memory and problems with attention, but there are lots of things that can cause cognitive problems. And I'm going to share the screen for a minute to try and um, illustrate this perhaps a little bit better. And uh, here we go, right over here. Um, so this is called the attribution problem, meaning what's causing my cognitive problems. And everything listed on this slide can cause problems with um, cognition. For example, depression and anxiety. Right now, I would say everybody in New York City has a very high level of anxiety. Many people have high levels of depression and related to COVID-19. Uh, That's normal. And probably all of us are experiencing some kind of cognitive problems because of those high levels of depression and anxiety. So even without lupus, those things um, can cause a problem. But directly related to lupus, there are a lot of other things. One could be the medicines. Prednisone in particular is well known to cause problems with cognition. Um, other things could be related to the antipostalism syndrome, which some of you know is to the problem of clotting. Um, cytokines are inflammatory proteins. If they get into the brain, they can cause problems. Our particular group um, focused a long time ago on antibody-mediated brain problems. And the reason for that is because all lupus patients make autoantibodies, right? These are the proteins that attack self. And these antibodies we know cause inflammation in other organs like the kidneys um, because we always biopsy the kidneys and actually see what's going on there. Um, so we asked the question, 
do autoantibodies get into the brain and if they do cause problems? And through uh, many years of mouse studies and our human studies with the lupus patients, we found that yes, antibodies do get into the brain and cause problems. And how do they do that? Some of them actually attach themselves to neurons, which are the brain cells, um, and kill them. And then the dying brain cells activate other cells in the brain called microglial cells. And once they activate these microglial cells, those cells kind of take on a life of their own. They take over. They start attacking the healthy neurons. And even though those antibodies may have disappeared, the activated microglial cells keep going, which is a problem. And then in time, we've learned this from the mouse model that it results in memory problems. And we think the same thing is happening in these patients. Um, we have used, as I said, different brain imaging studies and cognitive testing in lupus patients who volunteered to help us and found... Uh, that most of them showed there were certain areas where the brain lit up in lupus patients that it doesn't light up in healthy individuals. And those areas uh, correlated with poor performance on the cognitive testing. And that was just so important to us because it really was the first time that we've been able to identify a marker for cognitive problems that are due to lupus and not due to medication or coexisting anxiety or depression. So then we thought, okay, well, now let's go back to the microglia cells. Remember, those are the ones that are attacking healthy neurons. Turns out there are a bunch of medications that can control them. And one of them is called ACE inhibitor. Probably a lot of people on this um, conference are aware of them or take them. ACE inhibitors are blood pressure medications that are already approved for 20 years by the FDA and very, very safe. And in addition to controlling blood pressure, they control microglial cells. So we gave them to the mice, and sure enough, the microglial cells quieted down, the neurons were protected, and they didn't develop the cognitive problems. So that, again, very exciting. And we went back to our lupus patients' data from them and looked again at the um, images that we had collected over three years and realized that the patients who had been on ACE inhibitors just by chance during that time, their um, metabolism actually decreased. And we thought, oh, so it probably might help patients as well. And that's where we had the idea, let's create a clinical trial and really test this in a very scientific way. And that's where the LRA stepped in to say, yes, go ahead. We'll help you with that. Um, so it's very exciting. And I think we're probably going to open enrollment in just a couple of months. And it's great. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, that's Brilliant. I had no idea blood pressure, there was a connection between blood pressure medication and the mental issues that we're, we're coping with. That makes me very excited to hear more about the trial. Um, Priscilla, as part of the HSS Department of Social Work, you help, with, you help people with lupus through programs like Charlie the Lupus and Lupus Mind. Mental health concerns for people with chronic illnesses are often taboo, particularly in today's world. So, could you speak to those with lupus and their loved ones about how to identify depression, how to cope, um, and maybe some strategies to deal with mental health concerns? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Martin, first of all, for that really kind introduction. It's really an honor to share this space with you and to be a witness to your lupus journey. And a special thank you to the Lupus Research Alliance Young Leaders Board for your invitation to participate in this important and timely conversation tonight. Um, I, I'd first like to begin just by acknowledging that this has been a really exceptionally trying and unpredictable time for all of us. Uh, the stress really for many of us heightened with the global pandemic, which touched each of us very personally and exposed longstanding social and economic health disparities in this country. This burden of stress, anxiety, and for many a sense of rage and hopelessness has really been further exacerbated by recent, recent incidences of police violence against Black people and injustices among people of color. Many of us are really experiencing a wide range of emotions in response to everything that we're witnessing and experiencing in our country and our communities. 
and you yourself may find may find yourself feeling discouraged, drained, feelings of anger, which can make it especially difficult to manage or prioritize your own mental health. So during this time, we also may not be worrying about our own health and safety, but that of our family and our friends. And there may be concerns about work or finances and feelings of sadness, anxiety or isolation. They're all a normal reaction and natural reaction to some of or all of these stressors. Um, you know, research really tells us that patients coping with a chronic illness like lupus are at higher risk for depression. And as Dr. Mackey started to introduce in lupus, depression can really occur as a reaction to just some of the daily challenges of having a chronic illness. It can also occur as part of your medication or your treatment plan. Um, clinical depression is also not very easily recognized um, in people with lupus because its symptoms and the symptoms um, of clinical depression can, can be closely mirrored. So for example, a lack of energy or trouble sleeping can be attributed to lupus, but are also symptoms of clinical depression. So as a mental health professional, I always tell my patients that caring for our mental health is just as important as our physical health. And in the same way that we would see a physician for a physical symptom, for a rash or um, for any type of physical symptom, we may need to seek additional support from a mental health professional like a social worker or a therapist to really support our emotional and mental well-being. So um, you may have often heard or you yourself may use the word depression to describe your feelings of sadness. Um, I think it's important to really distinguish the differences between feelings of sadness and clinical depression. Feelings of sadness really tend to come and go, and they may be related to something going on in your life, but usually the sadness does not really affect your ability to function for any length of time. And with clinical depression, you begin to see some more severe changes in mood that are, that are more long lasting for about two weeks or more. Um, and some of the warning signs really include a lack of energy. You may see overeating or undereating. Um, an inability to sleep or excessive sleeping, and some may even begin to, to increase alcohol or drug consumption as a way of coping. And this is really when we want you to pay more attention to these symptoms and reach out to for additional support and, and identifying new ways of coping. So at this time, I really want to transition to some of those different coping strategies and offer some tips that may be um, familiar to you, but are going to be definitely helpful reminders to help optimize your mental and emotional well-being during this time. So first, it's important that you stay connected with your rheumatologist and other healthcare professionals. Um, you know, they really need to know how, how you're feeling both physically and emotionally. Um, depression and anxiety, as Dr. Mackey was saying, can really make it difficult to manage and treat your condition. Um, and providers are really there to help you explore the best way to address your feelings. And this really may include referrals for counseling, um, talk therapy, or sometimes medication. And currently, there are many physicians and providers that have transitioned over to telehealth or virtual services um, due to COVID-19. Um, and so that's a, that's a great way to stay connected with your providers during this time and also through your patient portal for non-urgent medical questions. So another important tool is really to build a support network. Um, families and friends can really be an important source of support. Forums like this um, are especially important as well. Peer-to-peer -peer support groups can really provide that encouragement and offer you a chance to really share and learn from others. And due to quarantine, many have been feeling really isolated from loved one and friends. And we know that social connection is really important to our mental health. And um, you know, there are several ways to still stay connected while we're physically distancing. So a lot of the patients that we're working with have been sharing, exploring virtual activities at home, um, Zoom parties, group cooking classes, or some of those strategies to help you stay socially connected. Keeping active, um, studies really show that exercise can really be a natural antidepressant. So physical activity such as walking or yoga can really help to ease tension and promote relaxation. If you're able to, taking a walk while wearing your mask and practicing physical distancing can help you get some exercise in. Um, even a few minutes outdoors or just sitting outside can really help to improve or boost your mood and minimize some of that social isolation, which is very common right now. Um, additionally, the Lupus Research Alliance and many other organizations are offering programs virtually like yoga or stretching to help you stay active, even um, moving and active while you're home. 
seeking mental health counseling. Um, we know that talk therapy is very beneficial in helping people through difficult challenges, such as coping with a chronic illness. And so professionals are really there to help you understand your thoughts, your feelings and behaviors and help you cope with some of these stressors. Um, and if you're ready to start therapy, it's important to consult with a healthcare provider um, and to begin to research the type of therapy that may be a good fit for you. Um, Headsp Headspace is a really great resource that's um, available and it's currently offering free mental health resources, meditation and mindfulness exercises. Um, I know this is especially difficult for me, but prioritizing sleep um, is an, an important tool. Excess worry and fear can really prevent you from falling asleep. It can cause interruptions in your sleep pattern. However, a lot of studies show that sleep is important to helping our bodies fight infections and, and helping our minds rest and reset. So some good techniques are to try to practice good sleep hygiene. So integrating a relaxation routine before bed, like meditation, um, a warm bath before bed, keeping a consistent sleep schedule is extremely important and minimizing distractions before bed, especially 30 minutes prior to going to bed and winding down, um, really trying to reduce phone and TV contact. Avoiding excessive alcohol use is an important uh, strategy as well. Um, a lot of people think that drinking alcohol will improve their mood. However, alcohol and other substances can really increase symptoms of depression and anxiety. So if you find yourself relying on some of on alcohol or some of these other substances to feel better, it's important to really connect with a doctor or a mental health professional about more effective ways to improve your mood. Another you, strategy John. that patients and I have been working on is really turning your focus inward. So studies show that mindfulness based practices really improve our ability to cope with anxiety. So even 10 minutes of quiet reflection, um, guided imagery can really bring stress and increase your tolerance for it. There are tons of great resources like the Calm app or the Breathe to Relax app, which are also good to get you started. Um, and uh, I'd also just like to acknowledge that, you know, as we really start or as society starts to open, this can bring up a series of additional challenges and fears for the lupus community. Um, you know, if you've been remote working, um, you know, you may have concerns about returning to your on-site employer, managing social and professional relationships, moving forward, um, further feelings of loss or isolation, because you may be concerned that you're not really able to interact in the way that you were used to interacting. Um, you know, I think it's really important to check in with yourself and decide what feels most comfortable for you as you really begin, begin to navigate the outside world again. Um, I've been working with patients to really create a list of questions that you can have an open dialogue with your rheumatologist to assess your specific level of risk so that, that you feel a little bit more in control of this process. Last but not least, I think it's important just to remember to be kind to yourself. Um, you know, take the time to really mourn all the losses that you're feeling uh, individually, but collectively within your various communities. Um, some days are going to be harder than others, but really incorporating these mental health and self-care techniques can help to bring some, some normalcy to these trying days. And, you know, it's important to acknowledge the whole person. So I really encourage you to make use of these different tools and resources and activities that are best fit for you, that are the best fit for you, and really benefit both the mind and body together. So thank you. Thank you, Priscilla. Uh, I really, uh, I appreciate you bringing up the, the differences between clinical depression and, and how those can relate to signs and symptoms of, of lupus, because especially during this time, I've definitely been trying to gauge where I'm at um, and trying to remain healthy, uh, mentally speaking. And especially since we're returning back to normal, that raises up a little bit of anxiety for me. Um, but since we are talking about Charlie Lucas, um, I'd like to introduce Lillian Mendez. Um, so, Lillian, um, through your work at HSS, you also help people deal with lupus and cope with the illness. Um, can you share some success uh, that you've seen in people with lupus? Um, maybe bring up a personal connection or a story uh, you have of how you how you became a peer leader. Sure. Thank you, Martin. And hi, hi everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the Young Leaders Board members from the Lupus Research Alliance for having this discussion that is very needed in our lupus community today. And so my primary role as a peer health educator for the Charlotte the Lupus Lupus CHAP program at the Hospital for Special Surgery is to empower and enhance the quality of life for teenagers, 
young adults and adults with lupus and provide them with their provide them and their loved ones with support and education. Um, through the years as a peer health educator, the most important thing for me when I meet a person with lupus is to meet them where they're, meet them where they're at and build relationships. And what I mean by that is to, it's important to me to listen to what a person with lupus is expressing. They're going through a lot of stress, fear, and pain, especially in this day and time with COVID-19. Um, during the beginning of the pandemic, I had a patient who was afraid that she would run out of hydroxychloroquine when she heard in the news that it would help her with COVID-19. She started feeling anxious and adjusted her own medication and started taking less of the hydroxychloroquine in the event she runs out and there were no more refills. I encouraged her to talk to her doctor and I explained to her that the doctor and patient communication is very important, especially if you're adjusting your medications. She spoke to her doctor and they were able to speak with her pharmacist and insurance carrier so they can obtain a, a 90 day supply. Many of, you know, uh, many of us experienced that and are still experiencing and facing challenges with plaque no access during this time. Another um, person that I met, um, this is a young adult with lupus. Um, she started to forget to take her medications thinking she took it already. She already did not take, she realized that she didn't take it because by the end of the week, um, she noticed that her, her um, pill box was empty, was full, was still full. Um, she was overwhelmed. She, fought, she suffered joint pains at night and was difficult for her to fall asleep. It was hard for her to remember. So we came up with a plan and she started to write it down because the pill box didn't help her. And I reassured her that it's okay to do that. She set her alarm reminder on her cell phone and she also put it on, um, she jotted down on her calendar and to remind herself that it was okay to do that. Um, this made her feel responsible and accomplished. Um, we talked about how dealing with stress can sometimes make us forget or act in ways that we usually wouldn't without even noticing it. We were also able to identify some of the things she was feeling overwhelmed by and I provided her with additional resources to help her. I often refer many of our patients to the Lupus Minder app that helps you track symptoms, has um, medication reminders, you can store your doctor's information and pictures of physical symptoms in between visits or any information you would like to share with your doctor. I worked with another patient with lupus who was having a hard time balancing her work schedule and became anxious and overwhelmed due to overwork, overloaded work. She was flaring and didn't know what to do in her situation. Um, a few pointers that we discussed was to remember to pace yourself, set your daily to-do to -do list, writing it on paper, um, put it on a calendar, remember to add lunch to your schedule, and use it to meditate. Your, during your lunch, use it to meditate or do nothing. Um, try to set the things that have a deadline first and have an open, honest talk with your manager about your situation. I encourage her to be realistic with herself by not overdoing it at work because sometimes um, you can burn yourself out. And remember, it's okay to set limits for yourself in the event that you need to take off. Um, speak with your manager about the possibility of your work accommodations. Um, um, experiencing like... Um, Going through all this, I can truly, truly relate to these individuals because as a person with lupus myself, I remember when I first was diagnosed with lupus, I worried about my future, having constant fatigue, which caused me to have low self-esteem and negative thinking. Um, I would forget to take my medication. Sometimes I felt like no one knew what I was going through, but the struggle was real because I was in pain every day and at times, I, I would call out sick from work and I felt, you know, it made me feel guilty about I shouldn't be in this situation. It's really hard to accept adjustment because it changes all the time when you flare up. I can feel, you know, it feels like you're starting all over again, especially if you've been in a remission or, you know, you're flaring up and you're, you're having activity. And I had to remind myself that lupus is not me. And what keeps me going is the support of my family and my faith in the Lord. And it's also important to find what works for you. 
and have a plan, like talk to your doctor, join a support group, stimulate your mind by learning new things, exercise at your best. And, and if the best is like walking or stretching for 15 minutes a day, you did your best. Uh, meditate on your breathing, trust in your faith-based community, or talk to a therapist and seek help to identify what is the underlying cause of your unwanted action. Um, the point of the matter is to find something that helps you. Everyone with lupus is different. And to me, helping a person to cope with lupus day by day is so important, reminding them that they are not alone, educating them to take one day at a time. And that's what we can do, one day at a time. And to realize that our body and mind needs to rest from the stresses of this world. Um, and there's always hope. Um, we are here to support you no matter if you feel like you're in a situation that is not important or you feel that you're not important or maybe you feel like your mind is going crazy and you, let me tell you, you're not. You have to reach out and remember that you are important and you are valuable. And that's the experiences that I've had, you know, speaking to many, many, many patients and what I have experienced myself. Thank you. And, and I, I, oh, thank you, Lillian. I was going to say that uh, uh, in terms of struggling with going in and out of remission, um, I can appreciate your plight, and uh, I appreciate you sharing these, these useful examples. Um, you, you bring strength to, to those who feel isolated through these, through these examples. So thank you, Lillian, for everything you've been doing for the lupus community for the past 19 years. <laughs> uh, I'd like to introduce um, Tao Stavia. Um, she works as the, the Chief Scientific Officer with Lupus uh, Research Alliance, um, but she's also, she's also helped establish the Brain Bank uh, Program. So um, following these great present, uh, presenters, um, Tao, uh, I'd like to ask you more about uh, your experience with the Brain Bank and specifically, uh, from what I understand, up to 95% of people with lupus experience neuropsychiatric lupus, which describes, you know, a range of brain-involved symptoms, symptoms like not thinking clearly, forgetting things, seizures, strokes, psychosis. Um, so helping to break through the fog, this program that you're a part of allows researchers to study lupus and inspect um, the brain. So would you introduce more about the, the brain program and the value it can add to the future of lupus research and, and how other people with lupus might be able to get involved? Yes, I'd be glad to. Thank you very much, Martin. And thank you also for the, to the Young Leaders Board for um, giving um, an opportunity to share news about this program, the LRA Brain Bank, which is really a brand new program that is just getting off the ground now. So LRA has had a longstanding interest in studying neuropsychiatric lupus. You just heard from Dr. Mackey about the phenomenal study that she is about to launch that is LRA funded. We also have um, a handful of additional uh, studies on this topic. And the reason we fund research is because it's really important to understand the disease mechanisms, going back to what Dr. Mackey said, that it's all about mechanisms, as she pointed out, um, and being able to understand what's happening at the individual cellular level and uh, molecule level so that better uh, treatments for people with lupus can be developed. However, to study mechanisms, um, as Dr. Mackey also nicely pointed out already, we really need access uh, to human uh, brain tissue um, and cerebrospinal fluid. And um, a lot of many actually groundbreaking discoveries have been made in other fields like autism, Parkinson's disease, um, Alzheimer's by studying um, brain tissue from deceased individuals with these diseases. And we now want to do the same in lupus. So the LRA is asking uh, people with lupus to make one of the most meaningful contributions to advance our understanding of neuropsychiatric lupus um, and to consider um, to uh, register for uh, perhaps uh, becoming um, donors of uh, brain tissue for lupus research upon one's passing. Now I want to emphasize that um, we um, appreciate that for the vast majority of uh, people with lupus who may be um, interested in this, an opportunity to make such a gift to research um, may not really come for decades. And that's a really good thing because people with lupus are living better and longer lives. 
Um, however, we still felt that there was um, a real need for this program to exist in order to provide researchers with this critical resource um, to be able to understand neuropsychiatric lupus better and to develop um, therapies for it. Right now, there are no treatments or specific therapies for this particular aspect of lupus. Um, and so what happens when we do um, have this precious uh, resource, uh, we will make it, we're working in collaboration with the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center, um, which is uh, working with a number of other foundations uh, on other uh, special diseases. And we will make this uh, tissue and resource available to all investigators, both within the lupus community and outside of the lupus scientific community to make groundbreaking discoveries on neuropsychiatric lupus. Um, so if um, anyone is interested in uh, finding out more, you could go to um, lupusresearch.org slash brain bank. Um, thank you very much for um, your interest. Okay, well that's, uh, that's brilliant. Um, even as a lupus patient being here, the whole point for me is to be more involved in, in my care and um, to be more available to these clinical trials. So it's, it's great to hear these resources that we can all be a part of. I, I really appreciate you bringing that out. Um, so uh, now we're at the point of our panel where we can open up the open up some questions for the for the attendees here. Um, there are also some questions that registered folks have already submitted. So uh, with that being the case, uh, this question I think is going to pertain mostly to Priscilla and Lillian uh, with Charlie De Lupus. The question is. What are some ways lupus patients can advocate for themselves in the workplace when experiencing lupus problems? Thank you, Martin. That's a really good question. Um, beginning the conversation can often be the hardest part of the accommodation process. Um, it could be really emotional to, uh, especially if you haven't really chosen to disclose about your condition at work. So one first step is to really educate yourself about your specific rights for to request reasonable accommodations. A next step is really working with your doctor to discuss and figure out which accommodations are gonna be most helpful to you. Um, and definitely having your doctor, doc, your doctor document that in a letter so that you can have that as part of your request for reasonable accommodations. And in relation to lupus fog accommodations, a lot of patients who may have particularly help com trouble um, completing their work, you, you may be able to request a change in schedule. So, um, you know, you can request for a day that either begins later um, or to begin a little bit earlier, really depending on your specific situation. Uh, you may need to ask for more frequent breaks um, to help yourself rest and reset and, and process information. Um, you may also want to ask for additional equipment and materials to really help you complete specific work, work tasks. So, um, you know, I think something that's important to note is that for many people, there's concern that requesting accommodations can threaten your, your job or your role. Um, so if you're looking for more support, I definitely encourage you to reach out to a peer or um, a social worker who can really walk you through that process. And uh, the JAN or the Job Accommodation Network is a, is a free service and it's actually a really great service that I often uh, share with patients and they can really help and work with you to brainstorm accommodations that may be a good fit for you. Um, and consultants are really there to also help you coach and have these conversations about um, work accommodations. Brilliant, thank you. And, and, and just to uh, follow up with you guys, would you offer or do you have any other recommendations of other support groups that people can reach out to? People yeah, abs people. Sure, absolutely. I mean, the, there's several different organizations and we partner very closely with a lot of different organizations. And I think our motto is really to connect patients to the services that fit them best. And so LRA offers a support group and a lot of different organizations through social media have really moved to virtual platforms. And so I, you know, I really encourage you to do a lot of research and we have actually, um, following the presentation, we'll be sending an email list with different resources that everybody can access um, from support groups to mindfulness to some of the mental health resources and applications that we talked about during the talk. So please be on the lookout for those. Beautiful, beautiful, thank you. Um, the next question I, I think would probably pertain mostly to Dr. Mackey, um, but feel free other panelists to jump in. Um, this question is, how do I know my cognitive health 
has been impacted by lupus? Are there cognitive dis- or and is there cognitive disorder? Uh, is it progressive? Um, is the cognitive disorder progressive, or does it happen occasionally? So those are very good questions. I think the first part of that is how do I know if it's due to lupus? We actually don't really know that yet, as I was discussing when I was talking about our research. We're just now coming up with markers that are specific, so they're not generally available. We're working on that. Um, How would you know if you have cognitive problems? I would have to say, from our research, um, that all of the patients we tested most of them thought they did not have cognitive problems, probably 95%. But when we actually tested them, um, they had trouble. So very often you can go through your day-to-day activities and, and everything is fine. I think the problem that happens is that over time, which is uh, the second part of your question, they tend to become progressive. But I can't say it's always going to be. I don't think we know yet, Um, which is why we really have struggled to find markers early so we can follow it and see what we can do to prevent that progression, because we do think it will be progressive over time in some people. Um, And I will say that uh, we as physicians, lupus doctors, Um, We pay a lot of attention to the joints and the skin and kidneys, but we never ask or very rarely ask about anxiety and depression. You know, we pay attention to the things we know how to treat well. So I think that's our shortcoming as doctors. We have to be better about asking patients how they're doing in terms of cognition. We should be better about testing people too. all things to think about. I appreciate that honesty, Dr. Thank you. Um, The next question I think, uh, I think pertains to to all of us. Uh, The question is, I'm newly diagnosed. What is one thing I can do now and things to do daily to assist myself in better cognitive health um, and assist in better sleep with this? Also, if you can share any tips for focusing, whether in school or work or otherwise, um, or sharing tips about supplements one can take to better help their cognitive health. Um, health. Uh, that being the case, I, th- I feel like, Priscilla, you talked a lot about that in the beginning um, when it came to dealing with lupus fog in the workplace. Um, but I don't know if we covered exercise as, as something that can help, something you can do daily. Um, what are your thoughts um, on on ways to manage cognitive health, when it, you know, uh, ways to manage it purposely. Like, what can one do? Do you think? Uh, that's a great question, Martin. I think to to kick off, I think what's most important is, and I talked about this earlier, is really that peer support, especially when you're newly diagnosed. Um, you know, Lillian can speak more to this, but being having that ability to really connect with somebody um, and others who really understand the challenges that you're living day to day is extremely important and powerful to really help you build tools and strategies as you, um, you know, as you go through your own journey. And so there, in addition to that peer support and learning new strategies from your peers, um, you know, I did mention exercise definitely being um, an important coping strategy, especially just trying to keep active um, as much as you can. Oftentimes, um, especially if you're experiencing joint pain, um, it may be daunting to think about um, moving, but, you know, research really shows that getting, um, doing any type of movement can really help improve not only some of that pain, but also help improve your mood that can be down because of the the pain that you're kind of experiencing uh, daily. So um, I don't know if anybody wants to add, Dr. Mackey or Lillian. Yeah, I just wanted to. I just want to add. Um, that's a great question. Um, a lot of times when you're diagnosed with lupus, you're in denial. You know, you don't want to accept what you have, and you don't believe that what you're going through or what you're thinking is really happening. But one of the things is that to reach out to your, your support group, your family, your talk to your doctor, try to build a relationship with your doctor, make it comfortable for yourself as much as you can and get support. And um, what my experience um, when I'm having a lupus fog is 
I work out, you know, um, I go for a walk. I like to stretch. I like to um, keep my mind going um, and work out. I haven't worked out actually because of the pandemic. It was hard, but actually this weekend I went for a walk and it felt really good, you know, to take that breath, fresh breath air and, um, and keep your mind going and remember that you're not alone. Um, the support is there, but it's a little scary because if your newly diagnosis is new to you, you just want your life back. And for me, you know, um, one of the things is that just remember um, sometimes when people try to help you, they're not pushing you. They're just trying to encourage you. They're trying to learn this as well. Um, it's a scary situation, but you're, you're never alone. There's always support, the LRA, um, the support groups that we have. Um, and yeah, just connect. Connection is so important. Yeah. Absolutely. I feel the same way. Um, that's why I got the bike hanging out out here. Um, Dr. Matthew, Dr. Matthew, were you about to also add something? Um, well, I just want to add one little thing because I think Priscilla and Lillian said it so brilliantly. Um, is I am just a, for two years now, been a huge believer in exercise. And when my patients do it, it is revolutionary um, and two types of exercise. One is physical and that has real, as Priscilla and Lillian said, it has real solid effects on the brain that we know about. It, um, it makes the brain happy. Um, but the other thing is, you know, exercise your brain. It's very easy nowadays to get sucked into lots of social media and your brain is going from here to there to here. To, it's not focused. If you train yourself to focus, read a book every night, you know, or do a project, the more you train yourself to focus, you can get back into that groove much more easily at school as, as I think the questioner was asking about. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, I love that. Uh, I know being out of school, it, I've gotten into the habit of, of being lapsed the basical when it comes to uh, training my mind, you know, continuing to read, continuing to write. And I do, I do feel that uh, thirst of energy when I taking the time to focus and, and create something. Um, yeah. So that's, that's usually what I, I'm finding as helpful in coping. Um, the last question I have that we have time for um, relates to the brain thing. Um, so, Sarah, I wanted to ask, uh, it seems like a lot of people are interested in being a part of the brain bank and even donating to the brain bank. So would you uh, elaborate on how one can do that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that opportunity. Um, so as I mentioned, the LRA is working in collaboration with the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center. They're the entity that will collect the samples, store them, and then distribute them for research. And because of that, they're also the entity that is responsible for obtaining consent from individuals, from potential donors. And so by going to our website, you could request that a packet of a couple of pages of consent form be sent mailed to you. Unfortunately, we have to uh, send a hard copy that then anyone who's interested may read while they have time and consider discuss with their family. I think that's a really important aspect that if you feel that you want to become an um, organ donor, uh, you really need to discuss that with your family um, to uh, prepare them um, to um, let them know what your wishes are. Um, and then you can complete the form and mail it to the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center all of that information will be on the form. In fact, we will provide you with a stamped and addressed envelope to make it as easy for, for you as possible. Uh, so basically, the bottom line is go to um, lupusresearch.org slash brain bank, and you will find the information there on where to request um, that special form that I mentioned that you need to complete and mail. Excellent. Excellent. Um, thank you, Tara. Uh, now, uh, for all those uh, watching, um, I know there's a lot of information that's been presented tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm moderating it and I'm still also trying to get notes too, but this will be recorded and it's going to be available on all social media platforms and on the website, lupusresearch.org by next week. So feel free to share it with others, watch it, take more notes. Um, Dr. Maggie, Dr. Steva, Priscilla, Levine, Thank you guys so much for your time with us today. Um, research, I think, is key to understanding lupus. And as someone with lupus, I'm looking forward to the new realms of safer treatment 
um, which I think research will usher in. Um, I also want to emphasize the critical role people with lupus can play in research. Um, so if, if you are interested in participating and contributing, visit lupusresearch.org for more information. The Young Leaders Board is a great group of people who have lupus themselves and have loved ones that are affected by this strange disease too. So, and, and we're looking to expand our group. So feel free to reach out to me or um, reach out to us to keep in touch if you're interested. Uh, speaking of, one of our young leaders, Adrian Nicole, is participating in the International Soulful Yoga Day on June 21st from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So continuing today's webcast conversation, Adrian will be speaking about lupus and mental health. Also, a certified yoga instructor, Karen Taylor Bass, is partnering with Black yoga teachers to offer a virtual wellness experience with complimentary yoga, meditation, panels, mental health awareness, check-ins, and a virtual marketplace for small businesses. So, wrapping up, I want to thank our audience for joining us today and being a part of this journey to unravel this invisible disease. It gives me hope to see so many of us taking initiative in our health. Your support, your support for the Lupus Research Alliance and the LRA Young Leaders Board make it possible to continue this search for a path through the complexity of the disease. So, again, thank you guys. Thank you all. Thank you, Martin. Martin. Thank you.